Hello everybody, thank you for joining. Um, whilst we're waiting for our guests to filter in, um, just to let you know that you will be able to submit your questions to our panel, who you can see on screen at the moment, uh, via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. Um, and there's also the chat button if you have any technical questions and you'll be able to get in touch with myself directly. So we'll just give a few more seconds whilst our attendees filter in. And just a reminder to our new attendees, um, if you have any questions for our panel that you can see in front of you at the moment, there's a Q&A function at the bottom there. Uh, you'll be able to send those in. If you see any questions um, that you like, you're able to upvote these and hopefully our panellists will be able to get to them during the session. If you have any technical questions, you can use the chat function um, and message myself direct and I'll be able to assist. Otherwise, Vori, over to you. Hey, uh, thanks very much, Kate. And thank you very much uh, to all of our attendees for joining so punctually uh, so we can get this um, going at two o'clock. I see we've still got a few more people coming in, um, but I'm aware that most of you in attendance will have many other things that they are doing today. So um, I'll start off by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Bori Blount and I'm the Admiralty Manager here at Reed Smith um, in their London office. Um, so I work in the wet shipping department, uh, which is involving casualties such as ship fires, groundings, collisions, all the very fun stuff that happens at sea. Uh, prior to that, I worked at sea for seven years um, in the cruise and ferry industry before making the move shoreside. Um, I am joined by three fantastic panellists who are giving up their time today to discuss a very important topic, which is women, women in the shipping industry. Uh, Captain Fran Collins started her career at sea, where she dual qualified as a deck officer and engineering officer before going on to become the first female captain for the Channel Island operator Condor Ferries. After moving into a shore-based career, Captain Collins became the Executive Director of Operations for Condor before moving on to take up the hefty mantle of CEO at Red Funnel Group, a ferry operator running routes between Southampton and the Isle of Wight. Captain Collins was awarded the prestigious Merchant Navy Medal for her services to the marine passenger sector and under her leadership, Red Funnel has signed the Women in Maritime Pledge and they're taking explicit steps towards gaining their chartership. Welcome, Fran. Thank you very much for coming. Antonia Panayidis is a partner in the Transportation Industry Group at Reed Smith, where she deals with a wide range of dry shipping matters, such as charter party disputes, bills of lading and shipbuilding. Antonia was called to the bar in 2006, and then she went on to qualify as a solicitor. She joined Reed Smith in 2008 as an associate and was promoted to partner in 2018. In addition to her practice, Antonia is the staff partner in transportation, where she looks after the well-being of all the personnel within the group, something that has been made even more complex by the difficulties of lockdown and the different issues that has created. Antonia has published blogs on the use of blockchain and hosts annual Reed Smith shipping seminars in both Cyprus and Germany. Welcome, Antonia. Thank you for attending. Our third panellist is Dr. Catherine Sykes, who is a consultant psychologist and coach who specialises in working with those people in high pressured careers, such as law and banking. She is accredited by the British Association for Behavioural and Cognitive Psychotherapies and is on the British Psychological Society's Register of Coaching Psychologists. Over her 25 year career, she has made a significant contribution to psychological research and has published numerous scientific peer-reviewed research articles. As well as presenting internationally, Dr. Sykes serves on the editorial board of the Journal and Health Psycholo of Health Psychology, where she peer reviews all the latest research. Welcome, Dr. Sykes, thank you for joining us. So uh, we're going to discuss three key topics around women in the shipping industry. Uh, approximately 15 minutes on each one. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box or raise your hand as Kate stated, and we will try and answer as many of your questions as possible. So our first topic is, what is it like to work as a woman in a predominantly male environment? So Fran, shipping, it's still a very male dominated world. 
uh, but it was even more so when you were doing your training. How did you find it working in such a male dominated environment? Thanks, Rory. I think it was, it's one of those peculiar things that you don't know what you're missing in a funny sort of way, because obviously when you go into uh, the shipping as a, as a woman, you don't see the other side of it. But certainly when I went away to sea, I was 16 in 1993. There were, I think, three girls in my class at college and around about 40 boys. Um, and then I went away to my first ship um, six months after my initial training where I was the only girl and I've always been the only female woman on the ships that I've sailed on until I came to ferries, really. So it was interesting. I think there's an element at that time when I went away of the unknown from other officers and um, from the crew. So there was a fear factor of what can we say in front of her? What can we do? What do we behave? And then from the other side of it, there was the, and, and I think I was quite lucky. I've not experienced a lot of discrimination, but there was an element straight off of, well, can this woman get in the engine room? Can you do things? And certainly um, I was lucky to work with a number of oil majors, but one of them had um, a lot of predominantly Italian officers who were quite offended by the thought of a woman in the engine room. And that actually contributed to where my career moved and became more focused on the deck side because I just didn't get the opportunity to get the engineering time. But overall, I think I was quite lucky in that most people, once you'd proved that you were a not going to fit in, but you weren't going to take offence at, at things, and you weren't expecting massive change to be made just to accommodate you. Most people were, were pretty supportive. And I would say, you know, through my career, I've definitely been the recipient of far more support than I have of negativity. But probably coming ashore is one of the harder things that when you come ashore, people seem to, to doubt your credentials a little bit more. I think certainly from an officer perspective at sea, having that ticket and going on board and saying, I've got my license, I've done my time. It's, it's almost a passport in itself. Yeah, it was interesting you saying there was three, uh, three women in your group. Um, I think there were six in mine when I started in 2011. So it's um, not, maybe not progressed as much as we would hope. Um, do you how feel many like qualified, you, Rory? I qualified in 2014. And how many of the, the women in your group qualified? Uh, I think we lost one on the way through. Mm -hmm. So five, five women qualified out of my group. And I think there was 60 who started. 40 who made it all the way through to the end. Now your stats were slightly better than one. We had all, all of the women in my group qualified, but only 11 of the guys qualified. Yeah, it's interesting that the, I guess maybe proportionally more women mm -hmm. have made it through, but it's still not a very high number. I mean, do you feel that the shipping industry is doing enough to bring women into the industry? I think the shipping industry is, 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 probably not doing enough to bring people into the industry full stop. We, you know, we're not getting people through the door of, of any gender. Um, I think also it's, it's the retention side of things is, is difficult. And of the, the three of us who qualified from the group I was in, I'm the only person who is still in the industry. Um, the other two left quite, quite early um, for various reasons, but it, that how we get, how we make shipping look attractive as a career point number one and how we make it how we demonstrate that it is changing is it's just that shipping takes so long to change and especially with the career you know the amount of time it takes for example to get a master's license you're looking seven to ten years progression is naturally going to be slow yeah i think um of everyone that i was in with i think there's three women are still actually at sea um and i'm still kind of in the industry uh but uh, the rest have left uh, a lot of them to have children actually has been the the main the main shift um, so actually tying in quite nicely to what it's like to be shoreside as a woman in uh, the shipping industry um, I'm going to start passing the ball over to Antonia because um, Reed Smith actually have 54% of all their associates are women um, and was it similar to when you started out in the industry? Thanks Laurie Yes, actually it was, and it continues to be, and I think that's because, I suppose, we're in a law firm, this is a law firm, and women seem to be very attracted to the law, and I had a look at the Law Society's website, actually, and in July 2019, there were 14,520 females accepted onto law degree courses, and only 6,370 men, so there were twice as many women 
joining on to law courses and then actually also being admitted to the role. There were 4,421 women admitted to the role and only 2,551 men, which I found quite interesting because I, I thought that was the case. Um, but that's for the legal position, uh, legal position as a whole. But what about the shipping group? Well, most trainees that come to Reed Smith don't necessarily have any experience of shipping law. And it's not until they actually do a seat within the shipping group that they find out more about shipping law and the shipping industry. And I think male or female, once you experience shipping law, you get the bug. Uh, it's a fascinating area of law. So we do find that even at the associate level, we do have a fairly representative 50-50 women male men split. But we don't see that same representation at partnership level. And I suppose there's a number of reasons for this, but you know, just most recently, some, something I've firsthand experienced, obviously being a woman, if you do decide to have children, it's hard to juggle family life and a career as a city lawyer, let alone when schools decide to shut for a year due to a pandemic. I mean, let's not even get started on that. It's, it's a tough gig. Um, but, but certainly we are we do have more women at, in our group and I'm hoping going forward we will see more at the leadership levels as well. Um, so do you feel that because you're saying you want more women in the partnership uh, end of things do you feel that law firms are doing enough to assist women to stay in the industry? Yeah I think you know speaking from Reed Smith's perspective I can see that there are a number of initiatives and steps that are being taken so we have a network of women called Winners and this comprises both male and female but but the idea is is to help women to develop their to their fullest pot potential and position themselves for advancement and success and you know that's been a great help for me throughout my career and it's something that I'd urge people you know within Reed Smith to reach out and, and take that help um, but also even recently that network assisted me when I was you know I, I left at home with two kids uh, my husband had to go out to work because he's a key worker and there was another lady another partner in the corporate group that reached out to me I'd never met her before started a whatsapp chat and we had this sort of a, a great support system um, so so it's excellent and but there's many many other initiatives like returners rs so again this isn't just for females it's for men and women who have to take out a period of time out of work whether it's maternity leave whether it's illness or secondments and the idea is uh, that this policy is put in place so that when they return it has minimal impact on their career so there's for example for associates and 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 fee earners hours is a really important thing in a law firm and you know you've got got to get your hours in and you've got to do so many hours but returners rs allows people to ramp up so to find their feet you get dispensation on your hours so that you can get back into the group thing pick up cases um yeah so that's another great policy we've got um true up which is something that didn't exist when i first qualified and you know and and, and a lot of women at that time were working part time, but as we know in the shipping industry, it's a 24 hour, seven day a week job. And so uh, one of my colleagues had an arrest on a Friday of one of her clients vessels and she can't just say I'm not working It's my non working day, uh, but you wouldn't get paid for it back then, whereas now you're compensated for it. There's policies and procedures in place to ensure that you, know, you don't have any sort of discrimination in that respect. So, so yeah, steps are taking place. Thank you. That is uh, excellent to hear what steps are being made to get women, more women up to being partners. Um, so actually, before I pass over to Catherine, we've had a question pop in, which I think would be best for Fran, uh, from Louise Worrell, uh, who used to work in the Royal Navy, uh, was also a minority as a woman at sea. Um, so do you find that in the shipping industry in general, more women are moving into support and shoreside functions rather than being actually at sea? I don't know, Fran, what your experiences that at Red Funnel and wider industry? Yeah, I think I think that is it is a case of that that what happens for one reason or another. And I think you know even my myself as an example, I was seconded um, when I was sailing as captain into the office to do an operations manager role and I didn't want to do it. I was quite happy. And I remember saying to the, the then operations director, no, I like driving ships, thanks, I'm fine doing this. And he said, just come and do it for six months. If you hate it, you can go back. Um, so I was in, I was almost enticed ashore and then I came ashore and found a different world, which I really enjoyed. 
And I think there are two, two things. There's, there's that side of things where we see talented people, they come ashore into the office. I'm looking at you here, Bori, as well. Um, <laughs> and then we, we, lose, we lose the people out of the fleet into that. And then the other side of it, which goes back really to biology, is, is having children. And I think in, in many cases, it's quite hard to go back to sea, especially deep sea, once somebody's had children, wants to be close to their family. So I think, yeah, people, women probably have a higher proportion for coming ashore, but for generally good reasons. Yeah. I was just thinking that sounds very familiar coming into the office for six months to come. <laughs> um just for I used to work at Red Funnel for everyone that's um not aware of that so I worked in the office with Fran for a bit uh before I then moved here to a different office uh so Catherine and you coach a wider range of people men and women um but in your experience what have you found to be kind of the biggest issues women have raised with you about finding themselves working in a male-dominated environment um, well, I'd just like to start by agreeing with some of the other panellists that in all my years of working with females in male dominated environments, there have been huge shifts um, in abilities to navigate these environments, huge structural changes as well, which is all amazing. Um, but there are still issues. Um, and I see the, the main issues that uh, females in these environments are facing today are unconscious bias and structural discrimination. Um, and I'd just like to offer a few uh, bits of advice on how to, uh, how to deal with these very big issues. Obviously, uh, they are big issues and I can't cover that in, uh, in a few moments, but I think the main message that I'd like to uh, get across to females who are um, experiencing these types of biases in the workplace is, um, if you sense that, that you are being discriminated against, or if you sense that there are biases in the workplace, then it's really important to trust that feeling. Um, we actually have an innate sense that detects discrimination, um, and that's there to protect us. Uh, it's like a warning sign. Um, because you know it's wrong. Yeah, discrimination is wrong, and um, we feel angry if we feel discriminated against. So trust that angry feeling. We feel anxious if we are discriminated against. Um, trust that anxiety. It's there um, as a warning sign to tell you that that, uh, that feeling is real. And I hear a lot of um, females who, you know, they question these types of feeling. You know, is, is it me? Um, so my main message today would be to um, trust those feelings. They're there for a reason. Um, the second step uh, for dealing with these um, unconscious bias is it is more difficult. Um, you have to get yourself into um, an empowering emotional state. Um, whilst anxiety, anger and shame are very valid feelings if you're experiencing uh, discrimination, they're not a good emotional state to be in to actually tackle some of these um, some of these discriminations. Um, so we have to get into an, in, an empowering emotional state. That can be a bit of an emotional journey. Um, but one thing that you can do to um, help you get into that state is to remind yourself that you have a right. If you choose, you have a right to correct biases. Yeah, this is uh, we're all in, you know, in a in um, a moment of change where all of these issues are being highlighted and we're all saying uh, that these issues are wrong. Um, the next step really is to find a ways to highlight that a bias is actually occurring. Um, you can do this uh, directly by directly calling out a, a, a bias. If you are going to tackle something uh, directly, I would recommend introducing the fact that you're about to um, tackle something directly. So you may say something like, um, can I just check something? Yeah, so you're introducing that you're about to um, point something out. And what this does, it helps to keep the other person's defenses down if you're introducing, yeah? So you're giving them a little warning that um, I'm about to point something out. Can I just check something? Uh, are you assuming that, yeah? Or you may say something like, um, 
can we just come back to something that really bothered me? Yeah. Were you assuming that? Yeah. So that gentle introduction to the fact that you're about to directly challenge a bias is, is helpful. Um, but sometimes you can't, you know, you don't feel empowered enough to, um, to tackle a bias uh, head on. So we might have to do this via um, body language. Yeah. Very subtle uh, changes in your body language. So you may just disengage uh, eye contact uh, just by looking to the ground or slightly turning away um, your body just to signal, I don't agree with what you're saying. Well, I wish I'd had access to you uh, when I've experienced um, <laughs> things like that, because that is, sounds like a much better way of dealing with it than being angry um, about yeah. it. Um, and that actually ties really nicely into our second topic, which is experiences of discrimination as a woman. Um, and I'm going to open this up to Antonia. Um, firstly, have you ever experienced any kind of issues in, in the workplace? I mean, hopefully not a Reed Smith, but in, in general. Um, so I'm, uh, well, one issue that I suppose many in the shipping industry will probably empathise with is as a woman walking into a room and that room being full of men, exclusively of men, and also more often than not older than me and therefore more experienced um, but also at five foot always taller than me as well so um that's some that that's less common these days but it's certainly something that i experienced for most of my career but i've definitely seen a change i'd say nowadays it's almost there's always almost always another female in the room which is which is great you're on mute that's become a classic phrase, hasn't it? You're on mute. Uh, so, um, so what was it like for you experiencing that as you walked into the room and it was all these kind of tall, older men? Like, how did you deal with it? I think with everything, it comes down to experience and you kind of equip yourself to deal with these scenarios. So um, certainly having confidence and self-belief in yourself is a huge, it's what you need to tackle these situations in my view. But in fact, you know, that doesn't, that isn't inherent. Confidence isn't inherent in you. I think you have to, you need a support network to help you build that confidence. And so from a personal perspective, I start, I started from a privileged position in that I'd say the three areas of my life, sort of my personal, my family home, my bosses, the people that I was directly working for and the organization all provided me with the support that I needed to build that confidence. So my mother was a mum to three girls and she instilled absolute belief in ourselves that we could achieve anything. It was very much a can-do attitude and not everyone has that mindset, right? So if I'm growing up in a mindset that I can, that's step number one. Um, and then if you have bosses who, although male, gave me the opportunities, believed in me, gave me the opportunities, put me in front of clients, allowed me to do presentations, gave me great cases to work on, all of those opportunities helps build my confidence and build my self-belief. And therefore, I think going forward, now I am in a position that, you know, I can influence as well. It's the onus is on, you know, Fran and leaders of the shipping industry now need to really think how they got there and make sure that we're offering the same opportunities and, and assisting females be, boost their confidence so that they can have these pay conversations quite naturally because they've got that self-worth and self-belief yeah very much so i think it really is a, a team effort to help develop that confidence um particularly in younger women that are, are newer to the industry um i'll give an example of when i was at sea um the only real overt sexism i ever experienced was from a fellow officer who told me to shut up and get back in the kitchen um, I won't tell you what my response was <laughs> because this is being recorded and I don't think that, that would do, do me any good. But he actually tried to complain about my response to my boss, who was the captain, who told him that he was actually just very lucky to still be alive. Um, so I had the full support of my senior management in that situation. Um, and actually, I went on to have a fantastic mentor as from that captain who really improved my confidence with ship handling and all that kind of thing so um as much as we talk about it being international women's day it's very much 
a group effort from all genders <laughs> to uh, kind of make this the norm. Uh, so Fran, when you were at sea, did you kind of ever experience any kind of either blatant or subtle discrimination as a woman? I mean, I think one thing that, that springs to mind was I joined a, a ship, I think I was second officer and the, the master was Norwegian. And when I joined, he said to me, there are two things I hate. I hate women and I hate tall people. And I was like, well, there are two things I can do neither about. Um, and I have to say by the end of the trip though, he, he didn't discriminate. He said that, but by the end of the trip, he was always fair. Um, and I got on well with him. I didn't ever feel I was held back. And I think there's an, in terms of discrimination, there's that element of when is the banter, because it is such a banter industry on ships, when is it wrong and when is it right? Um, and I've had things that people have said to me, which, and it goes to, to Catherine's points about the that feeling you get when you know it's meant or not meant, and whether you can say to someone who's crossed over a line and you can say, oh, wind your neck in a bit, or whether it's something that is much more inherent and much more damaging. And I think that's that's a balance. And one thing I would say is certainly on the shore side, that expectation of what I might be in a role for. And I was said to, as I said to you earlier, I was at a, a parliamentary event with a very senior MP and, and a minister. Um, they said to my CFO, what do you do? And he introduced himself as the CFO of Red Funnel. And they were then to me, oh, and what about you, my dear? And I said, well, actually, I'm the CEO of Red Funnel. And then his reaction was like, oh, well, well done you. Well done. And I was like, well, yeah, well done me. And um, I think that's that, that, that inherent bias. And some of it is, it's, it's, is it blameless? It's very difficult because we're looking at generation gaps. We're looking at class and culture gaps, but does that make it right? And the answer, you know, clearly that's not right. And that's something that, as, as I think Antonia said, we've got to address and we have to make it become the norm. It, it's okay to make a mistake, but it's not okay to carry on making a mistake. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I, I tie in a little bit with Antonia being, I was lucky enough to be brought up by um, parents that were very much instilling in me why I can go and do anything I want to. And actually um, my father sits as a uh, kind of a trustee on a Harbour Commission who recently got a new CEO. And in all of their talking on Zoom, they kept talking about when he gets the job. And it was actually my dad that went, well, it could be a she. And there was two other women on the board that went, ah, yeah, you know, absolutely. And it just takes one person to say it, to challenge that bias, which many people don't even necessarily realize is there. I don't know for you, Fran, if you found that kind of as a CEO, the, you know, how you found people kind of interacting with you before they know what you do, I suppose that kind of ties in with your experience there. Yeah, very much. I think one of the things that's actually um, quite interesting that both you and Antonio have raised about the supportive family. I came from a, a very similar background with um, a, a parents who were very much, if you want to do it, you can do it. And they were very, very supportive. But I know a lot of women in the, the industry who have come from the opposite background. And for what I think, it's either you go into it with a, a can-do confidence or you go into it with a I will do it confidence. Um, and I think there's that, 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 that piece. Some people are saying, I'm going to prove myself because I might have been told I couldn't do it before, but somewhere along the line that generally, and certainly at the more senior levels, there is that confidence. And a lot of it is built by the people around us with certainly the family values piece early on, but the people that we interact with, and again, with the keeping women in the industry, it's really important that I think we provide access to mentors and support, particularly at the junior levels in the industry, and that we make sure that that is that supportive piece that says it's okay to make a mistake and learn from it and it's how, how we can support people all the way through to stay in. Absolutely, I think mentoring is, is vital. Um, I know that uh, WISTA are working on uh, that kind of aspect of starting mentoring younger as opposed to only mentoring people who have kind of reached a certain point. Um, I think I would have definitely benefited from that as a as a cadet. Um, and Catherine, what do you think about, we we're talking about instilling confidence in ourselves Kind of what kind of advice would you give um, in general, not just for women, but in general for people to kind of instill more confidence in themselves in the workplace, particularly if they may be feeling discriminated against? 
Well, I think one thing to say about confidence is um, it's not a personality. Um, lots of people think that um, you know your you, confidence is something that you're born with. Um, it's not. So confidence um, is uh, impacted by lots of different factors, including the people around us. Um, and I'm going to co continue that theme as um, some of the panelists have mentioned that today. People around us, the people we work with, the leaders we work with, the culture that we work with, all of this impacts on our confidence. And sometimes there's a tendency when you're feeling um, unconfident to turn in on yourself and think, well, what is it about me? Um, you know, you may have come from this kind of can do family life or will do family life. Um, and I've seen people who've come from those backgrounds and you, you, you're right, these are important factors in confidence. But I've seen people who've come from those backgrounds who've been crushed uh, have their confidence crushed once they go into uh, a very toxic, unsupportive workplace. Um, so today, my advice is not going to be about um, what you can do to improve your confidence. I'm going to ask people to uh, look around them and say, well, what else? Who's impacting on my confidence? Is it the culture? Do I feel psychologically safe in the culture that I'm working in? Um, and rather than turning that question in on yourself, which we all do, there's all kinds of tips um, around, you know, what can I do? And that's all very, you know, valid advice. But today I'm going to ask people to look outward and say, ask themselves, what is it about the culture in which I'm working in that's impacting on my confidence? What is it about the leaders with whom I'm working? What is it about the, uh, the team, the, the, the culture, the dynamics that is impacting on my confidence? So that's my main message today is don't just look inward, but also look outward. I think that is excellent advice. And I would definitely be starting to implement that when I have crisis of confidence. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, we've actually had a question in for you, Catherine, whilst I've got you. Um, what are some things women can do to develop their careers and fight unconscious bias? Well, as I was saying, fighting unconscious bias, it really comes, the first step is about um, accepting and recognising that feeling rather than dismissing it. Uh, and I think Fran mentioned this as well. Um, it's really important, you know, we know when banter is um, banter and joking, yeah? And we know when it's crossing a line, yeah? We really do know that we have that innate sense. Uh, what gets in the way of trusting that innate sense is the questioning, yeah? And the self-blame, yeah? If we put the self-blame to one side, um, trust the feeling. Does it make me feel uncomfortable? If it does, then it's probably real. You've got to um, at first accept that this is a real feeling and then accept that the next stage for tackling this is more difficult. It's what I was saying. It's about getting yourself into that empowering emotional state. Yeah. It, it, it's normal and very valid to feel angry about this and anxious and sometimes even shameful. Um, but we have to deal with those emotions and get ourselves into a calm state. Even though the, the emotions are valid, we need to be in a calm state to actually tackle it. Yeah. And sometimes that is verbal and sometimes that is um, via body, body language. And coming back to um, Fran's incident in the House of Parliaments, um, you know, that, that was obviously a, a very tricky situation. Um, my advice in that situation would be um, to have used body language to almost like, you know, disengage from the comment, um, not even give any eye contact to someone who is uh, being patronizing like that. Yeah, we can do a lot with our body language and, and um, removal of, of our disengagement of, of eye contact. Um, so, yeah, trust the feeling. That's my main message. Yeah, it's there for a reason. Trust the feeling. I think that's a definitely an excellent take home message for everybody as well from that. Um, OK, so our third and final topic for today is something that is very close to my heart um, and I think to all women, which is the gender pay gap 
Um, I'm just going to briefly explain what the gender pay gap is. As there's often some confusion, people think that the gender pay gap means men and women who do the same job being paid differently. And that's not the case. That is illegal. Uh, that was outlawed many years ago. Um, the gender pay gap is the difference between the average hourly pay for the male staff and the average hourly pay for the female staff across the whole of the business. So how it's done is the companies submit all their uh, financial records and basically it splits everyone, all employees into four quartiles. So you have your upper quartile, which will be people like the CEO, senior management, all the way down to the lowest quartile, which is the lowest paid jobs essentially um, at the business. And they then publish all that information. And the aim obviously is to have no gender pay gap. Um, that is the dream for that all men and women are equally distributed. So what it shows, if you have a gender pay gap, it generally shows that men occupy the higher paid positions within the company with the women generally occupying the lower paid one. And now shipping has a fairly historically high levels of gender disparity. Um, and we were actually talking about this a bit earlier, the kind of old crusty seafarer kind of um, look that people seem to think the industry has. Um, in the UK, only 3% of all certified officers are female or identify as female. Um, now Fran, Red Funnel is well above that. Um, I think the statistic I got is an, about 8.9% of their certified officers being female. Um, so what do you think it is about Red Funnel that's had that big appeal and what are you trying to do to kind of close the gender pay gap in general? I know you've got more senior women now as well. Yeah, I think um, Red Funnel has one thing in its favour, which is the, the, the geographical way that we work. So because we're a short haul shipping firm, it makes it much easier for people and, and not just women, but for people who've had families and who want to stay close because our, all of our colleagues go home at night. And that makes it attractive, particularly people who have got young families. So we do see more women being attracted to that trade. The other side of it is, and if I compare it to other operators in the, the same trade, we do have a higher proportion of women um, seafarers. And that's because I think people see that we have a culture where we're supportive for women. And I think word of mouth gets around and, you know, very, it's a small world, particularly in UK seafaring anyway, let alone from, from women. So I think if if when people see there is a supportive culture we've as you say we're, we've signed the maritime uk pledge and we're on our way to chartership um and one of the things that i have now um since i came in is and it is i would say not by good luck rather than good judgment but when we recruited we were very inclusive in our recruitment process so my leadership team is actually a 50 50 split that wasn't planned and it wasn't a target or anything that set up it has just ended up that way but i think because of the way we recruited that helped us get the candidates in so we got a range of excellent candidates for the roles um, so i think again that that's that's echoed through the company we still have um some areas around the upper management where i'd like to see a better gender split but i think some of that will come in time as we start to take people from shipping and bring them into the shore side um, and one of the challenges as we were saying earlier is that with a seven to ten year career path to get a master's license it takes a long time to make a difference. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, it's um, definitely an issue to get women in within the shipping industry in higher positions. If you people will only recruit, for example, master mariners for certain shoreside management positions. Um, in my personal experience, I've found that not having a master's license doesn't necessarily make you a good office manager because they are quite different uh, sets of skills. So do you think there's any potential that the industry as a whole maybe needs to reassess its kind of focus on you must have a master's license to be able to do this job shore side? I think that's a really good point. It's, um, it's a thought provoking point because there are a lot of roles we ask for a master's license in or we ask for senior management experience on board. And some of that comes back almost in a way to credibility. So there are some roles that we would see in the office that it again, and this is a, a huge cultural piece of industry wide, I guess, to say, that we're saying to people who are coming to the office, potentially I'm thinking of roles like the, the DPA, so a very critical safety role that's going to be giving instructions that it's hard for the individual coming into the role to, 
to have the respect and the credibility if they don't necessarily have the experience and the certification. Um, the experience is one thing, the certification is another, but they tend to go hand in hand. But I think it's a fantastic point, Vary. I'm going to take that away and think about it. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so uh, moving away from kind of the operational side, um, Antonia, at Reed Smith, they're making fantastic strides in closing the gender pay gap. I've been reading all the reports. Um, and in 53% of the upper pay quartile in 2019 were women. Um, and although there is a mean gender pay gap for the staff, so everyone below partner, which is 14.4%, uh, at partner level, the gender pay gap is actually negative, uh, which means that the female partners are actually being paid more than the male partners. Um, so what do you think it is that's led to this success at Reed Smith? I think it's great um, for you to highlight that, Rory, but I think Reed Smith, we reward people based on performance, so it's wholly merit based the structure. It's not about how many years experience you have. It's all based on performance and merit. And so the structure, this structure, I think, in, in, you know, assists in fairness and, and equity. And I have no doubt that those women who are earning, uh, earning more have bring in more business. They have bigger clients bring, are bringing in more money to the firm, have key clients and add significant value to the business and, and are therefore rightly rewarded for it. And as I mentioned earlier, there's lots of initiatives within Reed Smith, which assist in the promotion of women, a winner, winners being one of them. And also in, there's internal processes that, that go on, which perhaps aren't seen uh, beyond sort of, uh, you know, the partnership level. But at each process in terms of recruitment, compensation, progression, there's always somebody who has an eye at those meetings to gender representation and diversity. And I think that's really great because we're seeing it come through now um, at the higher levels. Yeah, I, we were discussing this a bit earlier and I think Catherine this ties in with your point about how it's not just on the individual but it's on the organisation to be doing more to do this. So what would be your kind of advice both for the individual and the organisation about the gender pay gap? You know, what, what would your, your thoughts on that? Um, well, my bottom line advice would be um, leaders and uh, females um, need to get more comfortable talking about money. Um, so still a bit of a um, embarrassment uh, around talking about money, you know, and in, in an ideal um, psychologically safe work environment, I keep using that term, but I think it's a really important uh, to highlight that um, it really does depend on the um, environment um, in terms of how you can uh, address some of these issues. But in an environment where you're feeling safe, ideally you would be able to say, um, you know what, I feel uncomfortable talking about money. And leaders would be picking up, oh yeah, you know, this person feels uncomfortable um, talking about money or I haven't talked to this person um, about money and that they, that they would be registering that. Um, but yeah, that's in a very kind of safe environment where it would be great if um, it's, it's okay to say, to, A, to talk about money and okay to recognize that um, I actually feel uncomfortable talking about this. So I may need some support and uh, assistance in talking about money. Um, I work with a lot of women who don't work in those kind of environments, more um, competitive type environments. And that's, um, it's a bit difficult, it's a bit more difficult because we, they can't openly say, um, I don't like talking about money because sometimes that's perceived as a bit of a weakness. Um, in those environments, I think it's really important that women stick together on this one. Um, and that they get the data together, they get reliable data, and they raise this at the table together. Um, yeah, so psychologically safe environments, um, it, it should be okay to say, I don't feel comfortable, but if you're not working in that environment, then females really need to be bringing this to the table together with the appropriate data. Excellent. Thank you. I mean, what a fantastic way to finish. Um, women sticking together as a team to bring down the patriarchy. No, I'm joking. Uh, but um, uh, that brings us up towards the end of our topic. Just, uh, I would like to open it up to any further questions that anyone has. If you can raise your hand or put them in the chat box, the Q&A box, if you have any questions. 
So we'll just wait uh, for 30 seconds or so to see if anyone has anything. So I think Catherine, some of your um, kind of your thoughts on that have been very, very useful. I know for me, uh, definitely, and I'm sure for a lot of our um, attendees here. Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Oh, we have got a question, very exciting, uh, from an anonymous. So do you think female leaders could do more to support juniors coming through? Uh, you know, Antonia, if you feel like you'd like to field that. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think that's a really good question. I think it's spot on. Frankly, we do need to, we do need to do more. We do need to be, as I said, with my experience that I gained, which was ensuring that females are given the correct opportunities, and that's something that it, it, it is incumbent on all leaders within the shipping industry to now ensure that females are given the right opportunities to have their voice heard, to see how the so that you can see how you know allow them to build self-belief and confidence they can only do that if they're given the opportunities so I think yeah absolutely and Fran I don't know if you've got anything you'd like to add on that because you sit on all sorts of committees and things about it yeah. um yeah I think it's around recognizing the different needs of different demographics um whether that's um from diversity from ethnicity from gender all of those things we're now as leaders we do have to make sure that we're providing different support because every group does need a different type of support in, in a different way so for me that's a, a really important piece and as leaders it's very easy sometimes to forget that because we're all guilty of almost being a little bit in our own molds so we, we come through and one of the things I think I've also seen um, and I've not experienced it and I hope I've never been guilty of it but it's definitely out there is that in the, some areas where you see there's only one woman on a ship they quite like the position of being the only woman and it's almost becomes a an exclusivity and I've I've had heard of issues where that's been an apparent so I think it's always incumbent on us when we are representative of our our gender in in a workforce to make sure that we're being inclusive and trying to encourage into it not being exclusive and saying well I'm here and I've done it yeah I very much I view it um sometimes you see some women go up and they smash the glass ceiling but then they pull the ladder up and others put the ladder down to encourage more women up and I think it's very much women need to encourage other women uh, to follow in their footsteps um, and I am having a few more questions in but unfortunately um, I think we are now out of time so um, I'd like to say thank you so much to all the attendees for uh, coming today and listening to this panel. Uh, there are a few more questions coming in and I will maybe uh, try and answer some of those separately in the chat. Uh, thank you to my fantastic panelists, uh, to Captain Frank Collins, Dr. Catherine Sykes and Antonia Panaides for taking the time today to talk about these really important um, subjects and thank you to all the team behind the scenes at Reed Smith, Kate Dunn, the business development team um, and my research assistant Katie Varney for getting this all together. I couldn't have done it without everyone else and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.